No joke. Every night at like 9 30 p.m. I get heartburn. Oh, no. For the last like week. Heartburn is. I got heartburn last night after that delicious taco. That was so oh, worth it. I'm sorry that you no, had no, heartburn. No. It was worth but it. But just getting my 30 on early. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Too. And this episode is brought to you by Prilocyc OTC. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this episode of Church Historia. Hearts to. Why can I not remember this phrase? Hearts to burn. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the second episode of the Church Historia podcast, Hands to Work and Hearts to God. I'm Leslie, our producer and co-host. And I'm Stephanie, our in-podcast historian. So today, Steph, we are talking about... The Shakers! Ah, the furniture people. Yep, the furniture people, Mm. which I think may surprise a lot of people in a Mm. podcast focused on Southern Christianity to talk about the Shakers because they, along with some of the other utopian holiness groups of the 19th century, a lot of people would associate them with places like New York and the Burned Over District, and they definitely have their roots there. But they traveled, and there was a Shaker community in Pleasant Hill, Kentucky for a number of years that thrived for a really long time. Hmm. And so we're going to highlight them today. Also, you will hear church bells throughout this episode, which is just something that can happen when one records on the campus of a place like the Skerritt Bennett Center, which is an old, wonderful school that's still standing in the heart of Nashville. And we get to record there, which is so fun. So welcome to Church Historia. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's begin. Let's begin. So last time we were talking about the revival at Cane Ridge in 1801, and we're going to stay, at least in the beginning parts of our conversation today, also around that same time. And we were talking about the religious tenor in this moment in American history where the revolution had just happened, and there's all of this possibility, and it's it's a hopeful time, it's a creative time where everything is new. There is no, there's no precedent uh, Mm. for how things can go. And so there's a spirit of experimentation and of seeking new and better ways to do things. And that also then applies itself again in, in a religious context. And so we see that same sort of energy of new creation coming up in this in this period. And along with that, we have the revival tradition that we were talking about last time and this immediate confrontation with God, this emotional connection and, and enlivening. We also have this idea that we can, we can make things better. We can bring them closer to perfection, closer to the ideal, both as a society and how our societies are structured, but also as individuals that Maybe, maybe perfection is possible here, hmm. here in, on this earth. And some of the big ones, names that people may have heard are the Shakers, which we're obviously going to talk about more today, the Oneidans and the Millerists. And as we get a little bit deeper into the middle of the 19th century, all of these choices also start to cause a little bit of angst because how do I know which one's right? Everybody's claiming to be the way and the way to perfection, but there's like, 30 options. So how do I choose between the 30 and everybody's claiming a sort of monopoly on truth. So what do I do then? And so we start to also see still this desire for perfection and sort of creating these perfect societies or better, better ways of being, but also with this kind of angst and concern. And so one of the additional questions that's sort of been omnipresent in the Christian tradition is when will Jesus return? Yeah, right. We've sort of always been asking ourselves that since the, since the very early church when Jesus says, I'm going up to heaven, but I'm, I'm coming back. And right. he's like, great. When? Tuesday? <laughs> like, can I pencil it in? When, when, are, when are you coming? And there's been a number of efforts over the years to figure that out and to calculate it. So along with this sort of utopic perfection People are still asking that question about when is Jesus coming? And then you get into questions about millennialism or amillennialism about will there be peace and prosperity before Christ Mm, comes, after Christ comes? 
by the time we hit the, the 20th century and, and things like the social gospel movement, the idea becomes that we can create a perfect world and then Christ will step it into that and that sort of we can redeem things and, and our redemption of them will be what sort of signals the second coming. Oh, wow. The, at this point, we haven't quite gotten there yet, mm-hmm. um, but there's still, these ideas are still sort of floating around together. And so you have, for example, William Miller calculates or thinks he calculates the sort of day of the second coming. Mm. And so he he reads scripture and he does his calculations and and he thinks there's going to be a few signs and they sort of all seem to line up. And so he believed that the end of the world would come in 1843. Okay. And a lot of people agreed with his math. And at the time, about a sixth of the American population thought that he was potentially right. Yes, right. And then when it didn't happen, this movement kind of fell apart. But I think what that shows us is that there is this great interest in the end of times in preparing for this. You have the Oneidans who are another group that start in New York and they are a society who sets to model themselves after community of acts. And so one of their big hallmarks is they truly believed in holding all things in common. Mm -hmm. And so they they challenged the traditional idea of marriage because of that and saw marriage as a kind of selfish exclusionary act where you created a bond that was more important than all others and that it became about me and my family. Mm -hmm. And so for them, they believed in a sort of communal marriage in which everybody was sort of equally married to each other hmm. and couples were sort of grouped and assigned to have children in order to sort of help with the temperament of the community. But that also then brings us to the Shakers. And the Shakers had one of the more obvious presences in the South with their um, community at Pleasant Hill. And so I thought I would start us with a little bit of the history of the Shakers and then a little bit about Shakerism and kind of how it plays itself out. So the Shaker movement was founded by Mother Anne, who grew up in Manchester, England, and she was married. She had four children, but all of them died very young. Mm-hmm. And that was a great emotional weight and a great trauma for her and something that she really struggled with. And in that struggle and in that trying to understand life and death, she had an encounter with God and felt God calling her and moving her in her spirit. And so she joined a group of other people who had sort of similar beliefs around the way that the spirit was moving and being spirit led. And so this group was initially called the Shaking Quakers. And so kind of modeled off the Quaker tradition of being very much spirit driven, spirit led and responding to that. This group was more physically animated, hence the the Shaking Mm. Quakers that eventually gets shortened to just the Shakers. Also, Mother Anne started receiving revelations about Christ speaking to her about how to live in perfection in this world and and how we are called to live in this world. And one of the big tenets there was celibacy and the confession of sin. And so much like the Oneidans who came to understand marriage and the focus on the family Mm -hmm. and the focus on the nuclear family as a kind of selfish act that centered us on ourselves and what is mine and led to putting that to a a place of primacy over the community and of a relationship with God. She also had kind of a similar hmm. understanding. And the scholarship that I've read, it's, it's a little unclear about whether she understood herself to in some way be the second coming of Christ or saw herself as a prophet of that second half of, of Christ. Because one of her main points is that God is neither male nor female. And so we have the male incarnation in Jesus Christ, but there is an additional revelation of God that is feminine. Hmm. And so it's kind of unclear about 
whether she saw herself just as a kind of prophet of that feminine revelation of God, or did she actually think she so, was? Yes. The- yes. So that sort of sets an interesting dynamic up. And so this group, the Shakers, officially become the United Society of Believers in Christ's second appearing oh. with Mother Anne as its leader. And this, okay. you know, Christ is coming, the revelation is here, the spirit is moving. And probably much like you would expect, this this is a, a fairly big departure from sort of the dominant Christianity of the time. And so not super well received. Yeah. Um, not everybody is immediately thrilled about about these these revelations that she's having and, and the the things that she's preaching. And so the group faces a lot of persecution in England. And then also she has a revelation that God has chosen the people in America to oh. receive to receive this revelation and kind of lead it forward. So by the fall of 1776, they had Mother Anne and her group of followers had moved to New York. Okay, so that sort of situates the Shakers here in the United States. Then in 1781, they start a kind of proselytizing effort Mm -hmm. um, throughout New England and really start trying to share Shakerism Mm -hmm. broadly. Mother Anne dies in 1784, but the denomination still continues on. And, And I think one of the things that is unique about the Shakers is they had this charismatic leader who managed to set up enough structure that it it outlived her for a yeah. hundred odd years. And so the Shakers continue in their missionary efforts. They are traveling throughout the United States. And in 1805, they come to Kentucky. And so- This is after Cane Ridge. Yep. So about four years after Cane Ridge. And so the- Shaker missionaries find three Kentuckians who believe their message, uh, Elijah Thomas, Samuel Banta, and Henry Banta, and they become Kentucky's first Shaker converts. As part of his conversion, Elijah Thomas gives 140 acres in Mercer County, Kentucky, to the Shaker community. Hmm. And so that community comes to be known as Pleasant Hill. So by December 1806, there's 44 people signed up as part of that community. And so it's established then, and it's an active community until 1910. So it lasts for about a hundred years, which is a very long. um, Well, it's a very long time considering they believed in celibacy. Yes. Yes. You had to make a profession as an adult. Um, The Shakers welcomed anyone who was willing to come stay with them, even if they knew you're going to leave. So one Mm. of the interesting things about Shaker conversion is they would often take orphaned children or otherwise unwanted children. They would also end up taking a lot of people in in the winter Hmm. when sort of times were lean. And then they would go again in the springtime. But Hmm. hospitality was a huge part of the Shaker tradition and that that constant welcoming um, of others into the community. And so if you were raised as a child in the Shaker community, upon coming of age in your teenage years, you would have the opportunity to make an official commitment to that that line of faith. So children Mm -hmm. were raised, I'm going to say neutrally, that's probably not the best word, but Mm -hmm. they were not sort of full Shaker members until they were old enough to make a, a decision for themselves. So it is it is an interesting thing that in in that way the Shakers carried on for as long as they have. The last few formal Shaker communities were in the Northeast in New Hampshire and Maine. And it was interesting in what I was reading. I had thought that the Shakers had sort of officially ended. Um their sort of last member was in her nineties or maybe hundreds and had moved officially out of the community and into an assisted living facility. And that was sort of deemed by some to be the end of the Shakers. But what's interesting about Shakerism is it's about the ways the spirit is moving. And so Mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily need to have the same look it did before. I see. Along those lines, there's a, a 
great quote here from eldest Bertha Lindsay, who's writing from Canterbury, New Hampshire in 1986. And she says that one of her old singing hymn books says that the songs are made for the day in which they are sung. As the years go by, these will change and you will have other songs to sing. Times change and we have to accept what comes. Keeping up with the times hasn't taken away from our devotion to God. We don't accept that Shakerism is going to die ever. The physical appearance of Shakerism may disappear, but the life of dedication will always be here and the principles of Shakerism will go on forever. Interesting. It's just a really beautiful way of looking at things Um, and things I was struck as I was doing this research is how kind of open-handed Shakerism is with this sense of passage in time and change, Hmm. Um, which is interesting because in some ways it's a very, it's a very structured faith. Right. Um, There are Rules and rules and rules for everything. Elder Harvey Eads says, the shaker is the freest soul on earth because all of his bonds are self-imposed. And Hmm. so there's very much this idea of structuring life and following rules and bounds that are self-imposed in order to simultaneously free the spirit. That everything that you do should be done for God. So there's a shaker phrase about hands to work and hearts to God this idea of of work and the importance of work and the blessedness of work, but also the structure of the day and time for silence and cultivating this deep inner life through, to a certain degree, choosing not to engage or choosing to engage differently in the world around okay. you. And so I think that's a lot of what Eldris Bertha was talking about with these sort of principles of, of Shakerism. She has a lovely foreword in the book, The Shaker's Hands to Work and Hearts to God, Their History and Visions from 1774 to the Present, in which she describes her growing up years. So she was orphaned as a young child and was raised in the Shaker community in Canterbury, New Hampshire. And so she... She describes sort of the the principles of the Shaker faith in the following ways. We are simple people who believe in Christ. Like good Christians everywhere, if we live by his teachings, we are good people and good Shakers. We feel that the Christ spirit comes to each person individually, differently, not at the same time. If the Christ spirit is in my life, then Christ has come. We know that Christ is with us every day. We are patterned after the early church of the apostles. The book of Acts speaks to the community that anyone could join. We are celibate, and so we do not marry. We have nothing against marriage, as many people believe. We feel that marriage is a sacred ceremony that should be held sacred. But we feel that we can serve God better singly. That if we are married, it would be a kind of selfish life. We would have to tend to our own families, and our husbands and children would come first, no matter what. While we're celibate, we can have a universal love for everyone. We don't have children of our own, but we are very capable of taking care of other people's children. I've taken care of many little girls and have been able to teach them how to live a good Christian life. Hmm. Although we kneel down to pray or go separately into a quiet room, we also put that devotion into our daily work and our daily living. In order to have everything as perfect as God made it, we must have perfect devotion to whatever we do. If we live one year or one day or a thousand, we want to put the same love into our work as we would if we knew we were going to live forever. People love our furniture. They love the simplicity of it, but they also realize that it's the result of a life given to a loving people and a loving God. People who have lived before us, the wonderful consecrated lives that have been lived here have, I think, left their impression. We think that it is our mission now to give that spirit to people as they come here. We don't impose our religion on people, but if we are asked, we try to explain our what our religion means, and that anyone can live a shaker life anywhere because it is very simple. Just live by the teachings of Christ and meet everyone in a brotherly spirit with a lot of love because that is what the world needs today. Hmm. That sounds so modern in so many ways. It, it's this very interesting mix of some things that feel very modern, equality between the genders, although they are very separate. There was sort of a a communal time in the evening where they would sit in two rows and they could oh. talk to each other, but not alone because they didn't want to cultivate 
any feelings, feelings. Yes. Feelings. But you had eldresses in power, the movements founded by a woman who talks very highly and explicitly about the feminine side of God and that that is part of God's character. The Shakers were against slavery. They believed in emancipation. They accepted black members into their community, Hmm. which was an interesting moment for them in their history during the Civil War, especially in the South. They were also deeply, deep pacifists. Hmm. So they were sort of estranged from both sides because they accepted black members into their community and viewed them as equals, but also they would not raise arms I see. in a physical fight for that emancipation. Right. So right. a lot of their ideas around race, around gender, speak to a, a modern sensibility in some ways and a modern positioning And yet also you have this community that has very strict dress code, very conservative dress code, a very ordered existence with very sort of strict rules and and strict expectations. This is not an individualist community where you do what you want, but there is an understanding. And when you hear Shakers speak about their experience, it is almost through sort of everybody in this community following these rules and following these guidelines, they do find immense individuality and a very rich inner life yeah. um, as well. Mm-hmm. So Steph, after hearing about some of the history of this tradition and this group of people, what are some of the takeaways and what are some of the questions that we can ask of ourselves? I think the idea of structuring one's life to make space for silence and stillness is a really interesting one. I have always been kind of interested in monastic traditions and mystic traditions and space and silence is a huge, a huge component of that. And we see that echoed in lots of places today. I think that the prevalence of the recommendations around mindfulness and things like that are speaking to this same idea that we need to make space for silence and stillness, that if we want to be renewed and we want to hear what the spirit has to say, and if we want to love others well, you know, all of that comes from having some time, some, some time and some stillness. So I I think that that's perhaps a question for us, which is how do we build that in? The Shakers are very industrious. They, you know, there's a whole movement of furniture that we know about from them, but they worked incredibly hard. So this was not a community that sort of just prayed or just did religious things. They did very practical things, very pragmatic things, very work-driven things. They participated in commerce and yet still made time for this space. So what does that look like for us? What does What are our attitudes around work? And again, the Shakers understood everything they did to be an act of devotion to God. And so this idea of hands to work and hearts to God at the same time. Hmm. This is not hands to work Monday through Friday, hearts to God on Sunday morning. This is a a marrying of the two. So how can we cultivate that in our own lives? And especially for those of us whose primary work is not with our hands, but who either build creative things or digital things, we're still creating. And Hmm. how do we have this same devotion and and heart to God so that that thing that we have created is reflective of that devotion, of that love. I also think that the question of celibacy is an interesting one that was countercultural then and I think is countercultural now, but I think it's an interesting question to ask ourselves for those of us who are in long-term committed relationships or are married or have children, how do we honor that and and love those people and love those people deeply and well, and also not let that come at the exclusion of loving others? Huh, yeah. That how do we love the world and love all in the world while simultaneously loving these individuals that we have a a particularly special and unique bond with? I don't think you can study the Shakers without having to engage with that first pass at a tradition that would 
uphold celibacy, my first reaction is to say they have some problems with sex in general. It, it sex is wrong, or but that's not what they're saying. What they're no, saying is, in order to have a great relationship with someone else, a marriage relationship, there's a sort of selfishness that comes through it, and their emphasis is on everyone as a whole. Absolutely, absolutely. I I think you're right. I think a lot of times when we see sort of celibacy as a goal promoted, it does come with a condemnation of the flesh mm. and the desires of the flesh, and that you know the the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the the being and corporalness of being human should be subjugated and and contained so yeah. that the spirit can be free. And at first blush, that may appear to be the case with shakers, but on second and third look, they don't have this distrust of the flesh. They are very focused on the spirit, but again, this marrying of hands to work and hearts to God is you are a corporal embodied being God should be part of that entire existence. For them, that conclusion comes down to a celibacy in order to make sure that they are not being selfish in in their love or that they aren't putting boundaries around their love. That's beautiful. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today on Church Historia, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. It really helps new shows, and it helps people know that this show is worth listening to. Church Historia is Stephanie Fulbright, who's our in-podcast historian and tea mistress, myself, Leslie Eiler-Thompson, producer, editor, and in-podcast Iditarod expert. Our music today was played by Andrea Yoey, the beautiful hymn Simple Gifts. All episodes are recorded at the Scarrett Bennett Center in Nashville, Tennessee, 